Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're talking about fire, arson, and explosives. So when we're talking about fire investigations, arson investigations, investigations that involve any explosions, it's important to understand that um, what's really difficult is that a lot of the evidence is destroyed. So since the evidence is destroyed, we have to ultimately use what we have and, and try to analyze any information that we can get out of what is burned or what is charred in order to uh, recreate what had happened, recreate our crime scene, and, and figure out what the series of events were. So arson explosive investigations are difficult because of the whole idea that the scene is not intact, the evidence is destroyed. Investigators must look for motive, modus operandi, uh, to go with a suspect. So who could have done this? Why would someone have done this? Typically, when there is an arson, there's going to be some reason for it. Um, people don't typically go around burning things for no reason. Even if they are doing it somewhat for no reason, there might be uh, some ulterior motive where they just want to start fires. Sometimes you hear about firefighters starting fires. They want to um, create a... a a fire so that they can go and respond to it, maybe be the hero. So although they don't have a reason to start a fire in that specific location, so you're not going to have a motive for why they burn that one specific place, but you do have a murder motive as to why they wanted to start a fire. Criminalists will try to detect relevant chemicals or materials um, within the the burned objects, within the, the burned material and the charred material, and chemists will try to detect um, a gasoline or kerosene okay if there's gasoline there's kerosene that is detected well that's going to tell you that someone was using that as fuel to keep the guy the fire going or, or get the fire really um, burning well so currently there's no real test for what is used as kindling whether it was uh, curtains or they used paper or some kind of trash uh, so we don't really know what started the fire, but we can detect gasoline, kerosene, these type of fuels that people often use in order to get the fire uh, really going. So a fire may have been accidental whenever there's a fire and, and we're going in to investigate the fire. It's not always going to be an arson. It's not always going to be someone uh, started the fire. Sometimes they are accidental. You hear about all the time that uh, people start fires with uh, cigarettes, they lit cigarette butts, faulty wiring, and improperly cleaned heating systems. A lot of the times, people that uh, accidentally burn their house down, you'll hear about it because of cigarettes or because of uh, they left the oven on. So these things are accidental and they do cause fires. So even though um, when we're talking about arson, we're talking about fire investigations in Forensic science in criminalistics, we talk a lot about arson, but not all fires are arsons. The, uh, so when we talk about arson, we're talking about fire. Well, what is fire exactly? What is fire? Well, fire um, is really an exothermic reaction. It is an oxidation reaction. So uh, oxidation is the co the combination of oxygen with other substances to produce new substances. More energy is liberated as heat. So whenever we talk about oxidation, heat is created, known as heat of combustion. And light uh, that then is required to, um, more, more energy is liberated and light then is required to break bonds in these reactions. So when we talk about oxidation, a lot of times you're going to hear about fires, but we can also talk about oxidation in terms of rust. Combustion is a vocab word that you want to know. The rapid combination of oxygen, O2, with another substance accompanied by the production of he both heat and light. So when we talk about oxidation, we can talk about how, uh, you know, fires, burning of methane gas, you're going to have your methane, you're going to have oxygen. All fires need oxygen. That's why we call it oxidation. It's an oxidation reaction. We're adding oxygen to a reaction in order for that exothermic reaction to occur. So you have your methane gas, you have your oxygen, and you have some kind of spark, and that is going to produce heat. 
which is our energy that comes out, along with carbon dioxide and water molecules. It is an exothermic reaction. Another exothermic reaction that we talk about is turning metals into oxides, turning iron into iron oxide, or turning iron into rust. So you have iron, and once again, we have oxygen. Now, this is a much slower reaction that occurs. It's not as rapid as burning something, but it is an oxidation reaction where we're adding oxygen to it. So in the presence of moisture, this iron is going to take in this uh, this oxygen to the reaction and ultimately we make this uh, this iron oxide and heat is produced so it's not going to produce the heat like you think of that's going to come from a flame but over a slow period of time heat actually is produced along with this iron oxide which we call rust so that iron now becomes rusted iron which is iron oxide so these are two different examples of oxidation reactions they're both going to be exothermic reactions where heat is produced heat is given off some more vocab words to know exothermic versus endothermic exothermic heat and energy is going to be released it's going to be liberated such as burning such as rusting endothermic reactions heat and energy is going to be taken in like when we talk about uh, evaporation, transpiration. Causes of arson, about 98% of fires are started by hum humans. So 98% of all fires have some kind of link to humans. Only about 2% of fires have nothing to do with uh, human influence. 7% of all fires are arson. So it's not all fires, it's only about 7%, which you know, depending on how you look at it, it might look at it, it may seem like a lot, it may seem like a little, but seven percent of all fires are arson. Not it's not a hundred percent. Although when you're taking forensic sciences, of course, you might think that everything is arson because a lot of times we talk about arson constantly. But in reality, it's only about seven percent of all fires that are humans trying to set something on fire, some trying to burn something down. So some causes of arson. People often think about uh, revenge burning things down for revenge, concealing a crime, uh, getting rid of the crime scene, or burning all the evidence. But in reality, the biggest one is to impress others in some way. Vanity is a big one. Okay, Number one is vanity. So you might not think of that. Why would someone want to do this? But in reality, a lot of arsons, it's someone trying to uh, look a certain way to another person. Um you know, you hear hear about teenagers burning things down. Well, they're trying to look cool to the next guy, so they do it for vanity. Also, also fraud is a big one. And then we see pyromania. People like to play with fire. And then we see vandalism and mischief, revenge, crime concealment. And then a very small portion, or the smallest portion, is really coming from terrorism. So the big one is vanity. Arson indicator checklist. So the first thing we're looking for is the color of the flames and the smoke. All right, that can indicate uh, what really is burning. How was it started? Growth and size of the fire. Signs of tampering with protective equipment. Uh, determine if alarm system is bypassed. So if we see that someone yanked all the fire alarms out, they removed the batteries from the fire alarm. Well, that's going to be indicative of the fact that it was an arson, someone was trying to set this fire and they didn't want anyone to come and put it out preemptively. Evidence of tampering with windows or doors, any signs of forcible entry. So you are going to look to see if any windows were broken, any doors were broken into. Um, that's going to show that someone broke in and started that fire. Odors, immediately recognizable. Do you smell gas? Do you see gas containers, kerosene containers? And then multiple fires. Are there... Uh, point di different points of origin. So we often look for where did the fire start? Well, if we see that start in two different places, well, then that's not going to tell us that it was a fire from uh, the, the ovens uh, starting, uh, uh, creating that fire. It's not going to tell us that, oh, there was one cigarette in the ashtray that, that lit the curtains on fire. That's going to tell us that it was an arson. Someone tried to start that fire and they started at multiple points so that it would ultimately uh, get going faster. So separate and distinct, distinct fires with no signs of spontaneous combustion are going to tell us, hey, this is arson. Ignition temperature is another vocab word. The minimum temperature at which a fuel will spontaneously ignite. So 
um, everything will burn. But when we talk about fuels, they have a low ignition temperature. Gasoline is going to have a very low ignition temperature to the point where uh, it doesn't even take a flame to light uh, gasoline on fire. As long as you have enough heat, that gasoline will light on fire. Energy is a barrier. It needs enough energy. Depending on what fuel we're talking about, a low ignition temperature me needs less energy for that that uh fuel to ignite so enough energy must be provided to reach that ignition temperature fires need fuel and oxygen if one runs out then the fire ceases so what they need is that fuel that oxygen and they need enough energy for it to reach that ignition temperature without if you smother a fire it's not going to work if it runs out of fuel it's not going to burn anymore so without fuel and oxygen it's not going to continue now what people do is they make sure that there's enough kindling, there's enough fuel, and they make sure that there's enough oxygen, they open windows, they open doors, and that is going to keep that fire going. Matches are commonly used to ignite materials, okay? You can throw a match into something and walk away. Sparks and electrical discharge can also ignite materials. Another vocab word, flashpoint, the minimum temperature that a liquid fuel will produce a vapor or gas to burn. So uh, it's lower than the ignition temperature. So we need to get our fuel to become a vapor or gas in order for it to ignite, in order for it to reach its ignition temperature. So gasoline's flash point is negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and then its ignition temperature is just under 500 degrees Fahrenheit. So in order for it to become a vapor, it only uh, needs to be negative uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, then it can, uh, you know, once it's going to get enough energy, once it hits 500 degrees, with a, which a flame is uh, well above that, we're going to see that it will burn, okay? Um, pyrolysis, another term, decomposition of organic matter by heat. So when we talk about fires, we're talking about pyrolysis. Uh, wood is going to be solid, but we give it high heat. It uh, Gaseous products uh, are going to be created from the wood. That's going to be fuel. We add oxygen, and now we have fire. Another term is flammable range, the entire range of possible fuel con concentrations, gaseous in the air that are capable of burning. Too much or too little will not combust. Another term, glowing combustion. Okay, smoldering, burning without a flame. So things can burn without a flame. If you think about a cigarette, it's not constantly having a flame coming from the end of, of a cigarette. Uh, charcoal in a barbecue, there's not always flames coming from that, but this is burning without a flame. That's called smoldering, typically, or glowing combustion. Wood experiences glowing combustion after pyroliz pyrolyzable components are gone. So when you're burning a fire right after... It, it, it when you're burning wood after there's uh, you know that big fire eventually it starts to smolder and it's still burning within there those those embers are still burning but you don't see a fire coming from it in all fires as the temperature increase increases the reaction rate increases so as that temperature increases in your fire in your campfire you're going to see that the wood burns even faster Another term, spontaneous combustion. All right, things do spontaneously combust. Things do light on fire without uh, a flame. So natural heat producing process uh, um, in the presence of sufficient air and fuel. Remember, you need oxygen and you need fuel. And if it is able to get hot enough without that flame, it can combust. So usually in poorly ventilated areas, we're going to see this, that there's enough oxygen, but it is not ventilated enough for it to stay cool. It starts to heat up. We see this a lot in mulch. So if you have big piles of mulch, they actually will light on fire because there are bacteria in there that are eating away at the mulch. That Those bacteria through metabolism are going to create heat of their own. That heat starts to build up and then the mulch starts to, to light, light on fire. Another example we see in linseed oil and massage oils, if you leave them on rags, these are unsaturated oils with that have low ignition temperatures. And ultimately, uh, if they're in that those closed containers, these oily rags can uh, emit enough heat where they are going to spontaneously combust. Explosions, a little bit different from just uh, burning things, just fires. 
It's a buildup of gas pressure. All right, it's the it's the rapid burning of something that creates that gas pressure. So often need their own source of energy because it is so rapid of burning. Chemicals that supply oxygen are called oxidizing agents. Example: black powder is actually potassium nitrate, charcoal, uh, carbon charcoal, and sulfur. Uh, it makes potassium sulfide in heat. All right, remember, it needs fuel, oxygen, and heat. Now, when we talk about black powder, okay, it is uh, it, a, a low explosive. It, it does not have, it has a low velocity. It does not create a huge explosion. Where we see that it creates explosions is if we try to keep it confined. So if it's in the barrel of a gun, we're trying to keep that, that, explosion can find and it it once it lights on fire it has nowhere that gas has nowhere to go and that's what forces that bullet down the barrel if you just light black powder on fire without confining it it kind of just burns so it is not a high velocity explosive like we'll talk about in a moment so searching the fire scene must be done immediately before anything is touched or cleaned up we've talked about the fourth amendment before warrants searching once you uh, are, are searching through an area, you can search through an area when you're there because you're there for an emergency reason. Um, you know, you put out that fire. Now you can search the area. If you want to go back later, then you need a warrant. So you want to make sure that you're using the time uh, that you can. Also, if you leave and then you come back later, well, it's an open crime scene. You can't. You're not really watching. You're not making sure people aren't going in and out. Can you really prove after that point that someone didn't place something there after the fact? So you want to make sure you collect as much evidence as you can when you uh, uh, get to the crime scene the first time. You don't want to have to go back there days later with a warrant and look for things and then try to prove that someone didn't plant it there after the fact once you left the first time. So search for signs of arson. You're looking for fuels, any, uh, any uh, gasoline, kerosene, anything that's going to uh, burn. Um, look for containers of these things, gas containers, kerosene containers, diesel containers. Search for the origin of fire. This will give you an idea about which accelerant was used and the type of ignition de device. Okay, this is going to tell you, hey, did they use the couch to light on fire, to start the fire? Did they start the fire using the blinds or using the curtains? Search for signs of breaking and entering. And then find eyewitnesses for interviews, all right? Is there someone in the neighborhood that saw what happened or saw some su suspicious person or vehicle or someone fled the scene? All right, try to get as much information as you can from eyewitnesses. Telltale signs of arson started in two locations as well as using streamers to spread the fire, using paper, gasoline, something that is going to help it spread from the couch to the mattress or from... Uh, one room to the next room. These are called streamers. So searching for fire scene, search for the location of the most damage. Fire, uh, fires typically move upwards, but if accelerants are used, the floors will show charring and there will be more charring on the bottom of the furniture. So if they poured a ton of gasoline, you're going to see charring on the floor. If they did not, then you'll see that uh, fire is moving upwards. So a good indicator of using fuel is that the the floors are charred and there's burning and and oftentimes you actually see if you have wood floors in between the cracks there's actually this V because it's the uh, the gasoline seeped in and it started to actually burn the in between portions of the wood. All right, gravity will bring liquid sirens to the floor. And the bottom of the furniture, where you'll see the char charring of the bottom of the furniture, as well as the charring of the floor. Fo photograph everything before anything is moved and before you leave the crime scene. Accelerants often seep into the cracks, and that can be detected later because they do not burn completely. Practitioners, investigators can use highly sensitive portable vapor detectors, which they call sniffers, to detect flammable liquid residues, uh, heat, va heat vapor. It is, uh, it, if it reacts, then it is usually flammable liquid. So they actually are going to take this, uh, the residues back and they are going to test them. And that's going to tell them if there are any flammable liquids in there. Uh, 
searching for the fire to reconstruct the scenes and establish further research about fires, arson, and explosive. The Maryland Fire Research Laboratory was established, which is the first of its kind. It's the best of its kind to this day. And that is what we uh, base a lot of our arson investigations off of the information that they have, the research that they have done, and the manuals that they have created in order for us to understand uh, what the different things that crime scenes indicate. So collecting and preserving your arson evidence practitioners so you should use a new sealable paint can. So we talked about this previously, the brand new paint can. Can't, paint was never in there, but it looks like a paint can. You're going to collect three quarts of ash and soot debris um, from your crime scene. You're going to take it from your where you think the origin of the fire was, other locations as well. Porous materials should be placed in an airtight container to preserve the residues. Upholstery, rags, other materials that have not been destroyed, anything that's not destroyed um, or is partially destroyed, you're going to want to collect that. Obviously, if everything burned to the ground, then there's not a lot to collect, but there often things don't burn completely, and you will have some kind of evidence that you can bag and take back to uh, be analyzed by the forensic scientists. Substrate control, collect similar items from elsewhere to compare to the samples. Um, sometimes you'll see that um, you want to make sure that if there's some indication that the couch had uh, some kind of a chemical in it, all right, formaldehyde, well, did someone add that formaldehyde to it or was that just part of the materials? You never really know, so you need that substrate control as a comparison. They're important because some adhesives contain hydrocarbons, such uh, just like accelerants, and will be identified as a petroleum pro pro product when it is not a common petroleum product. All right, those hydrocarbons are there already; those adhesives are there in that couch already, and that doesn't, and we don't want that to falsely identify uh, a, a an arson when it really wasn't an arson. So collect containers with li liquid in them for comparison. Uh, you know, if you find a, a gas container or uh, something that uh, isn't a gas container but might have some kind of gas in it, you're going to collect those in order to analyze and collect clothing from the suspects. They may have accelerants on them, which can prove, hey, this person was pouring a ton of gasoline all over this house before uh, the, the, they, the house burned down. Paint can evidence containers are heated to make gas vapor, and then the vapor is removed with a syringe to insert into our gas chromatograph, chromatograph, remember, we are using GCMS. That is our staple in the forensic science crime lab. The newer way is actually to heat evidence container with a charcoal strip. So they have these special charcoal strips and it absorbs the vapor. And then the strip is removed, washed with this carbon disulfide solvent. And then it is put in our GCMS. When there's a mixture of accelerants, the GC is used with the mass spectrometer. Remember, most valuable tool in our lab. Explosions, right? Similar to a fire, combustion of gas with heat, but reaction occurs at a more rapid rate. Okay, more rapid rate, more pressure, and thus more damage. It creates a blast effect, which is an outward rush of gases and can damage more than the fragmentation. Uh, more than the fragmentation debris. So um, the blast effect is actually worse than the burning. In major, major explosions all right, in, uh, in Oklahoma City, we saw that it wasn't the fire that was created or that explosion. It was the blast effect that really took out blocks and blocks of things. So there's two different types of explosives, explosives that we talk about. We talk about low explosives or low velocity explosives, and we talk about high velocity explosives. Low velocity, uh, velocity of detonation is less than a thousand meters per second. We call that the speed of deflagra deflagration or burning. Uh, black powder, which is gunpowder, smokeless powder, um, which is the kind of uh, gunpowder that we typically use now. Found in, gu found in guns, like I said, it isn't very, very explosive where it's going to make a big boom if it's just a pile of gunpowder sitting next to you. But when you confine it, it is going to create that pressure. So <clears throat> that is how we create that 
that uh, we it forces that bullet down down the barrel. Now, high explosives or high velocity explosives, on the other hand, they have a velocity of detonation greater than a thousand meters per second, and it actually creates shattering shock waves. So, dynamite, TNT, PETN, and RDX, these are going to make big booms, big explosions, and they're going to uh, have that blast, uh, that giant blast effect, and they're very explosive. Even if um, you know it's just sitting right next to you, unconfined. Uh, shock waves can be up to 8,500 meters per second, and you need a safety fuse used to carry a flame to an explosive because you can't just light it on fire. Low explosives use an accelerant and an oxidizing oxidizing agent. Remember, you have to add oxygen to it because it, it burns so rapidly. Um, hydrocarbons such as petroleum, sugar, or starch. Oxidizing agent is typically potassium chlorate. So in those black powders, in that smokeless powder, you're going to see potassium chlorate in it as its oxidizing agent to add oxygen to it as it burns very rapidly and it needs a lot of oxygen. Single base smokeless powder we call nitrocellulose. Double base smokeless powder, you have nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. High explosive sensitive to heat, shock, and friction. So we're typically going to try to make them as uh, stable as possible. When we talk about C4, they, it's very stable, and that's why we actually need a detonator or, or we need a, another uh, explosive device in order to set it off. Lead azide, it detonates violently instead of burning, often referred to as primers because they are used to detonate other ex, uh, explosives. So you have lead azides, which are going to be added to C4 so that we can use that as a detonator to explode the actual C4 itself. Secondary uh, explosives, uh, they're, they're very insensitive. Uh, composition 4, C4, Dynamite, TNT, PETN, ANFO, and RDX. RDX is the most popular military explosive, um, which is actually the clay form of C4. So RDX is very stable. It's insensitive. Um, you know, if you ever talk to anyone in the military, they'll tell you that it's not something that is going to uh, just uh, blow up from too much friction. Now, if it wasn't stable, if it was like lead azide, then it would just by it being uh, taken from one place to the next in a van or, or in a Humvee, it would explode. So we actually keep these things separate. And then when we need to actually uh, make an explosive, we're going to add our lead azide with our RDX. And that is what's going to create our massive uh, explosion. So ANFO was used in the famous Oklahoma City bombing that killed 168 people, injured 680 people, and damaged a 16 block radius of buildings because of those shock waves, because of that blast effect. Um, examples of explosives <coughs> grenade is actually a small explosive. It's a, it's a spring loaded striker, makes a spark to set off a uh, tetral which is a detonator and explodes TNT. So in that grenade, you have TNT, which is going to be rather stable, but we use this tetril, which is spring-loaded, and it is going to be used as the detonator, the smaller explosion, to set off the larger explosion of TNT. PETN is used as a detonated cord called a detonating cord called primer cord to set off other explosions. Car bombs actually use their the ignition switch in the car as the detonator to set off the other explosive that was placed in the car. Just some final notes, explosives leave craters. So a fire, you're not gonna see craters, but in explosions, you're going to see craters, soil and surrounding materials should be tested for any remnants of the explosive. Using an ion mobile, uh, mobility spectro spectrometer or an IMS is very helpful, often referred to as a sniffer, like we said before. And then, uh, just as a final note, analysis of evidence should be should include uh, using a microscope as as well as then using thin layer chromatography and then high performance liquid chromatography and then our GCMS. So practitioners actually have suggested starting an explosive tagging program where all explosives that are made by any company have a chemical tag so that once it explodes, we can take evidence from it and we can um, identify which company came from and, and find its source. But obviously there's a big pushback. Any uh, 
person or any company that makes explosives, they don't want to have to worry about who they're, they're selling to. And then it all comes back to them and they're held liable for things. So there's pushback for that. But it is an idea that has been thrown around. So keep these things in mind as we move forward and we talk more about uh, fire investigations, arsons, explosives, as well as uh, firearms.